But we're going to continue to talk about the seed time harvest principle and the law of seed time and harvest. Again, it is God's desire that we reap his very best. That is key that we understand that God wants you to reap his life. There is a seed, again, called the word of God that came by faith in hearing the word of God. And when you receive that word and you believe that word, that seed gave you this spirit called the spirit of God. And it is from that heart that God wants you to produce his life. Amen? Amen. So God wants you to produce. He wants you to produce that which is good. He wants you to produce that which is good. So we're going to go to our text, which is Galatians. So if you go ahead and hit that for me. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. We'll read our text, and then we'll begin to again expound and teach beyond that point. And to God be the glory, we're all going to receive a word that's going to change our life. Amen? Don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. Remember that. Remember that. You can't ignore him and get away with it. His will will always be done with or without you, right? With or without you, God's will is going to be done because he said, My word that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper where into the thing I sent it. So his word is going to do its job. The question is, are we going to be found in that word? Because we are being found in that word. The plan that he put in us from the very beginning is going to be fulfilled for our lives. So it says you can't ignore God and get away with it. A man will always reap just the kind of crop he sows. Keep going. If he sows to please his own wrong desires or his flesh, or his senses, or what he sees, or what he hears, he will be, he will be planting seeds of what? Evil. Evil. And he will surely reap a harvest of spiritual decay and death. But, which negates everything that he just said, if he plants the good thing of the Spirit, he will reap the everlasting life that the Holy Spirit gives. So he gives two indicators here of how you can sow and how you can reap. You can sow to your flesh and reap death, which the flesh again are your senses, what you see, what you hear, what people tell you, your desires, what you feel you need to be doing, what you lust after, what, you, what you're compelled to reach for and, and drive for. If you reach for those things without the word of God or without the spirit of God, what you are bringing to yourself is corruption. Those things are vain. They have no weight. Your flesh has no life of God in it. It can get the life of God on it, but it has no life of God in it. The Spirit of God is in the suit. Okay? The Spirit of God is in the suit. And if we honor the Word of God, then the Spirit of God will come on the suit. Amen? So he said, if you're sowing to your desires, you're going to reap nothing. You're going to reap death. You're going to reap destruction. Some of the things that come with death are confusion. Let me help you. Confusion, anger, malice, envy, strife. Those are things that are reaped through the flesh. So if you find yourself feeling like this on a constant basis, constantly griping and complaining, it's because of what you're sowing into yourself, okay? But he said, but. Somebody say, but. but. Again, but negates what just ha- what he just said. So what are we negating? We're negating the sowing to the flesh. If you sow to your spirit, you don't have to reap the things of the flesh. You can receive the life of God. And this is God's desire because he gave us his spirit. And now he wants his spirit to live in us and also produce his life through us. Amen? Amen. Let's keep going. And let us not get tired of doing what is right. Somebody say, don't get tired of doing what's right. Find somebody and tell them, don't get tired of doing what's right. For after a while, we will reap. Say, you're going to reap. A harvest of blessings if we don't get discouraged or give up. So you're going to reap if you don't give up. Come on, preach to somebody. Tell them you're going to reap if you don't give up. Tell somebody else you're going to reap if you don't give up. So the key to reaping is diligence. Staying with it. Stay with it. There are going to be opportunities, and there are going to be plenty of opportunities that you're going to have to get distracted and walk away from what you planted. But what we are finding out here is the key to reaping is first planting the seed, the right kind of seed, and then staying with the seed through the process. Because Mark says as soon as the seed is planted, the enemy is going to come immediately to steal the word. Notice he said he's going to come to steal the word. Now, he didn't say seed. He said he's going to come to steal the word. 
Now, why would he say the word instead of the seed? Because the word is the seed. The word is God's seed. Did you know God was a farmer? God is a farmer, the best farmer ever. He planted one seed in the world and saved the whole world for a harvest. Amen? But how did he do it? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. His word became flesh, and we received his word as flesh, and his word redeemed us from death, which is spiritual decay, which came through the lusts and the desires of us fulfilling our life through our flesh. Amen? Amen. So God is a farmer. His word is his seed. He gives you his spirit because your spirit is his field. What he feeds into your spirit, he wants to raise up out of you because in you is already everything you need to produce his life. Because the spirit in you already has the life of God and knows what to do with the word. The minute you plant it in, it knows what to do with what you just heard. It knows how to develop it. It knows how to mature it in you. And it knows how to teach you how to, and train you up in it. So you don't have to try to make it work. You just work with it. Amen? So the key again is being diligent to it. So he says you will reap if you faint not. Then it says that's why whenever we can, we should always be, be kind to everyone. Somebody say everybody. Be kind to everybody. Okay, everybody. Especially to the Christian brothers. Amen? Amen. So if we're going to reap if we don't faint, and this is what the word of God is telling us. What do you think the enemy's desire is? To steal, kill, and destroy. And how is he going to do that? By making you quit. He wants you to quit. He wants you to back off of what you heard, back off of what you said, back off of your praying, back off of your worship, back up off of your love, back up off of your joy, back up off of your peace, and take on the manner of life of God trying to do it yourself. Because the minute he can get you to walk away from the word, you're already destroyed. Are you catching what I'm saying? So the reaping is in the first the seed called the word. So the first step to reaping is taking the word and putting it in my heart. How do I get it in my heart? By seeing it with my eyes and getting it in my ears. Everybody with me? So let's keep going. We're going to break this down some more today. We're going to go to Galatians 3 verses 5. All right? And it says, therefore, he who supplies the spirit, which is God, to you and works miracles among you. And here's the question. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Paul is asking them a question because he's admonishing them because they've been saved. But now they're starting to go back to doing things their own way. They're going back to the old way of doing things. They've been saved in their hearts, and God wants to lead them by the Spirit. But instead of being led by the Spirit, they're going back to doing it the way they used to do it. And he's saying, this is not going to produce life for you. So he's saying, he that produces life and gives you the Spirit and works miracles. Somebody say miracles. And he that works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, which the law means the law, the law brings in the works of your flesh to please God. Does he do it by the works of your flesh or does he do it by faith in receiving his word, who is Jesus Christ? Does he do it by you doing it or does he do it by you believing in what Jesus did to do it? He does it by the way that Jesus perfected it and you believed on it. That's why it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, who is the word of God? Jesus is the word of God. So when I look at the word of God, I see the life of Jesus. Jesus walked out the perfect will of God. He was the perfect walking example of the prophetic word of God in flesh. Everybody with me? So when I look at him, I'm looking at perfection. But since he died and was rose again for me, and when I believe in him, then I get his life. So what does that mean? When I look at the book, I'm also looking at me. And that's the thing God wants us to get in our recognition, our cognitive places, places up here. You are what this word says you are. This is why the renewing of the mind is so important. Because you got to get back to who he called you to be. And you won't do that without the word. Amen? That's why I get up here and preach this. So we can get this thing in our hearts. We can meditate on it all week. 
we can renew our mind to the fact that every time I look at this page, these words mean something to me because they are me. Not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus is. So I can receive everything this book says about me. That means if it says I'm healed, if it says by his stripes I am healed, Jesus is healed, therefore I am healed. So what do I do? I take that scripture, I put it in my eyes, I put it in my ears, I say it over and over to myself day and night. I worship God for the expectation of it like we just got through doing, right? And out of that worship, I intercede, I pray, I give my petitions to God, and he strengthens me to continue through the process. Why? Because the enemy is going to try to get me distracted by what the doctor just said. The enemy is going to try to get you distracted by what your friends see and they tell you about. You look like you're still wire fighting. You're still, you're getting skinnier. You okay? You still look fatigued. You look tired. You look, you all right? I'm fine. By his stripes, I am healed. That's called patience. That's called diligence. That's called understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. But in all you're getting, get understanding. Jesus in Matthew 7 says, The wise man, if you hear these sayings of mine, And do them, I liken you unto a what? Wise man. So we know that a wise man is first a person who hears the word and starts to do it. Okay? So as wisdom comes from hearing and you begin to step out on what you heard, you are now walking in understanding. Consider the word. Compound word. Understand. Under. Stand. Or stand under. What are we standing under? The word you heard. So what's protecting you from the fiery darts? Because it's his word that he sent to do it for you. It's his word that's going to defend you. He putting himself on the line. So if he don't protect you, then he's a liar. But since God and his word are one, he can't deny his own word. Because he puts his life on the line every time he says something. So if you take what he says and you step under it, and you walk out the presser of what brings with it, it's going to look like you're under attack. It's going to look like you're under attack, but it can't touch you because you're covered. So what you're looking at looks like it's going to get to you because the weight of it is on you. You hear the words. You see the actions. But you must understand that this word It's protecting you, and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, he didn't say, I'm going to condemn it. He said, you're going to condemn it. I've already condemned it. It's your job now to take what I said about that and line up with what I said. And if you do that, you're walking in understanding. And if you keep walking in patience and understanding, what you will have is a miracle. Knowledge of something that he told you about in the beginning. Are you catching what I'm saying? Let patience have her perfect work. Why? So that you would be entire wanting nothing. Well, when you started, you needed a whole lot. When you came to him with your petition, you needed a lot. There was something that was absent from your life that you went to him for. And he said, do this. Hold on to this word right here. This word is your deliverance. So that in your heart, and that word is going to produce in you a fruit after my kind, which is called Zoe life, eternal life. How many of y'all know eternal life don't have an expiration date? You might expire, but God's word don't. His word will cover you and your children and your children and your children's children. And your children's 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 children. That's how beautiful the blessing of the Lord is. That's why if you saw the word in your heart, it's not just for you. It's for the line that follows after you. Because if you learn what the word says, you'll teach it to your children. That's why he's called Abraham the father of many nations because he knew that Abraham would teach his children. 
They wouldn't forget what God told daddy. You can't forget what God told daddy because daddy saw so much of God that he can't forget what he saw. Is there anybody in here want to have that kind of life? I can't forget what I just saw God do. I don't want to forget what I just saw God do in my life. Did you see that? Did you see the miracle? Did you see that deaf ear unstop? Did you see that blind eye open? Did you see that crippled man get up? I don't want to forget that. I want to remember that. I want to teach my children about that. I want to write that down in the analogs of my life, and I want to remind myself of it every time I'm going through a hard time. So he didn't receive it by the works of his flesh. He received it by hearing the word. And because he received the word of God, God said, you're right. Think about that. He took God's word and God said, you're right. Now, you're going to mess up a whole lot, but you're still right because you acted on my word. You know who to come back to when you mess it up. I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to me because I mess it up. I don't hit the mark every time. But thank God I got a Savior who hit the mark every time. He never missed a mark. He never failed to temptation. He never failed to sin, but yet took on my sin for me. So therefore, when I miss it, I can look at him and see myself as him and stand back up even in the midst of my mess and confess what I did wrong and see myself forgiven by the blood of Jesus, see myself washed by the word of God and see myself as the spotless, wrinkled blemishless lamb of God you can wake up every morning and rejoice that's gospel that's good news it's not based on what I've done it's based on what he has done and because of what he has done I can wake up every morning and give him praise But you got to keep this word in your ears. You got to keep it before your eyes or you will faint. You will lose yourself in yourself. You'll get caught up in what you did do and what you didn't do. You'll get caught up in who likes you and who don't like you. You'll get caught up in who hurt your feelings and who do who your best friend. You'll get caught up in how much money you got, how much money you don't got. You'll get caught up in the promotion and the promotion you didn't get. You'll get caught up in the affairs of life. That's, what he, that's one of the M.O.s that he uses, the pride of life. Try to get you caught up in what you do and don't have. Get you looking in everybody else's house. I want what they got. I want what they got. He said, but I got something for you. If you take the word I gave you, plant it in your heart and work it out, you'll see the same thing, but you won't have to labor like they do. Let's keep going. Now, four, we're going to go Galatians 4, 1 through 7. I'm going to preach it like I got it. Now, I say that the heir, you're an heir. Say, I'm an heir. Now, I'm going to tell you what you're an heir of. You're an heir of the promise of God. Amen? This ain't come from your granddaddy. This came from your heavenly father. I don't know what your granddaddy left for you, but he might not left nothing. He might not even left a good name for you, but hey, in Christ, you got a good name. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards unto the time pointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Stop for a second. Let's look at that. Now I say that the heir, again, you are the heir. As long as he has a child, what does that mean? He's still immature to the promise. He's saved, but he don't know the promises on his life. He's still a child. My children have no clue what's in my, me and my wife's bank account. They don't know what kind of provisions we have for the house, and they don't care. <laughs> they don't. They don't care. All they know is when I say uh, Burger King, <laughs> get me a burger. You got the money. The smallest one knows where we get the money. Now she know go to the bank. 
I asked, I said, how do you know about the bank? I told myself, how you tell yourself <laughs> what the bank is when you don't even know what a bank is? <laughs> but nevertheless, the child don't know what's in the house because they don't pay attention to none of that. All they know is they're in the house. But what is not privy to them are all of the amenities that the house has. They have to grow up and begin to see these things and recognize these things. You mean I can go in that room? Yes, you can go in that room, and you have access to everything that's in that room. Well, how do I use that? Let me show you. And you begin to teach them how to use the things in the house. And the more they begin to discover, the more they mature. Until then, you guard them. I can't let you use the stove yet because you'll burn yourself. You can't use the iron yet because you'll burn yourself. You're not ready to walk down the steps yet. You just have to learn how to walk on flat ground. So I have to guard you. I have to steward over you. I have to watch over you until the time comes that you mature. So a child who has the promise of God on his life, but still yet does not know the promises of God in their life, is still a slave. Now, what are they a slave to? Their flesh. You're still a slave to doing what you feel because you have not recognized yet the promise of this Holy Spirit that's in you that wants to teach you how to live like God. So until you come and recognize who you are in Christ, you're still a slave to your flesh. Having Christ in you, you're muddling him up, and he's all... He's bundled up, wanting to get out, but we won't let him out. Amen? But under God is the stewards unto the time appointed by the Father. Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements, again, of what? Of the world. So when you had not received the word, you were living as the world lives. Let's keep going. But when the fullness of time had come, somebody say the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, under the guardianship of the law, to redeem those who were under the guardianship of the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. So in essence, what God was doing now, he was taking his word and he was releasing us from under the bondage of our flesh-made self and our flesh-made efforts and our self-pleasing ways to God. And he said, I'm about to give you a new way. But I can't do it without coming under the way you did it, the way that it came, the sin that came through Adam. I got to come and look like Adam so that I can take where Adam messed up, correct it, and then fulfill a new way for you so that this old way will be fulfilled in the new way. And you won't have to live by the old way because the new way will encompass it all. <sighs> this was the promise of God. I want you to have this kind of life without you working hard to try to have it. You don't have to try to be good. You are good. When you recognize that, you'll do good. I ain't got to beat you up about what you're doing and what you're not doing. If I preach the word of God long enough and you listen to it, it'll talk to you. If it wakes me up in the middle of the morning, it'll wake you up too. That's why it says it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. This word is alive. It is the very breath and inspiration of the heart of God. So when you hear it, life is coming to you. And not only life, but the voice of that life is coming with that life. And when you respond to that voice, you receive its life. You eat of the fruit of that life. We have received uh, the adoption as who? Sons. Let's keep going. And because you are sons, all right, this is your new life now. You're no longer the child. You're no longer the child. You are now the son. And God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your where? Where did he send him? He sent him to your heart, not your body. He didn't send him to your head. He didn't send him to your eyes or your ears or your nose or your mouth. 
And then send them to your feet or your fingernails or your hair. He sent them to your heart. This is where God is. So you can't see him. You just believe that he's in there. Amen? That's where so many fight. But look at what this, he sent the son into your heart and he's crying out. Y'all heard me saying something about that earlier today, right? The son is doing what? He's doing what? He's not sitting with his mouth shut, is he? He's crying out. Abba! Father! I need you. We need you. Our nation needs you. Our children need you. Our churches need you. I need you. Where's this cry coming from? Your heart. It's coming from my heart, not my head. It's coming from my heart, which means I got to get to my heart so that that cry can come. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. The child was a slave because they didn't know the promises. But that promise was under the law. So the law was keeping that promise from you. But now that you've received the Spirit, the Spirit will reveal what the promise is. So you no longer can sit and say, I don't know. If you listen to the Spirit, you will know. Are you catching what I'm saying? So you're no longer a slave. You're a son. God is talking to you because you can do his business. You've been bar mitzvah. You've become a son of commandment. You have been released to do the business of your father. Understand, so, <laughs> this is what the Lord had told me when I was studying this. He said, listen, son. He said, when the, before the word came to you, you were a child because you didn't know. But when the word came to you, you were no longer a child. I gave you the spirit of a full-grown man. Did Jesus die as a child? Or did he die as a man? He died as a fully mature man. So when you receive the word, you receive the life of God who is Jesus and who moved into you was not just a little boy from Bethlehem, but who moved in was a grown man. So you're operating as a grown man, even my ladies. Amen. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, you are an heir of who? An heir of God, meaning you have received God's life because of Christ. Let's keep going. So let's go to Galatians 4, 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Again, he's trying to talk them out of this whole working in the flesh thing because when we sow to the flesh, what do we get? Dis corruption, death, decay. But when we sow to the spirit, we receive the life of God, right? So he's trying to get them to stop sowing to your flesh because I'm trying to get you to inherit the promises of God for your life, okay? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, and he begins to break it down. For, let me give you a deeper revelation. The one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman, that he who was the bondwoman was born again, born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise, okay? Talking about Sarah and Hagar, all right? Abraham received the promise by faith from God. God told him, you will be the heir of the world, and all nations will be blessed through you. But they wouldn't be blessed by you and your, you alone, but you and Sarah, or Sarai. Sarah's going to conceive the child. That's the two that's going to get it done. But because Sarah could not bear children, she gave her handmaiden to Abram. Since I can't bear children, how about you just sleep with Hagar? Y'all thought stuff like that just happened on TV. Now this stuff happened in real life. How about you sleep with Hagar because Hagar can have children, and I'll just take the child that's my own since she's my slave. What Abraham do? Okay. Cool. Tell her to come on in. Abraham sleeps with her. She conceives. What do we have now? The Maury Povey show. You are the father. Sarah looking at her with contempt. 
She go to Abraham, you done messed up. You slept with that woman. You knew, you knew. But in her heart, she was condemning herself because she knew that she couldn't have children. So she knew that the problem didn't lie with her and lie with him. It lied with her. This man has a seed to give, but I can't carry it for him. I feel bad, so I'm going to take it out on her. I'm going to beat her up about it. I'm going to beat her up about it. But the promise wasn't on Hagar. The promise was for Sarai. We're going we gonna to get through some more. We're going keep, to keep talking this through. So what did I say? Verse 23 said, the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise. So the free woman who had the promise was the woman who couldn't have children. But the bonded woman, you had all the kids she want. Now, how abnormal does that sound? How, does this sound like the plan of God? Don't sound like it, looking at it from the surface. It doesn't look like this is what, you're going to get the one who ain't supposed to have my baby, the baby, but the one who's supposed to have my baby can't have my baby? What's up, God? I'm confused. My ways are not like your ways, and my thoughts are not like your thoughts. Just as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my thoughts from your thoughts. But I tell you this, no word that comes from my mouth shall return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper where until I send it. What I'm telling you to do, son, it's just what I did when I told you to leave the house and you left. I'm telling you to trust me. Take my word, walk up under what I said, and you will see that that woman who couldn't have a baby is about to have your baby. But what we had in the course of time was a detour. Because while he's walking in understanding, he hears a word from the wife. And he appeals to her word and stops looking. And he steps out. He sows to the flesh. Are you catching what I'm saying? He sows to the flesh when he should have stayed un, under the word in the spirit. But he sowed to his flesh, and he ends up conceiving a son called an Ishmael. So he don't have no Ishmaels. Let's keep going. Which things are symbolic for these, the two covenants? So here he goes, breaking down the two covenants, the law and the spirit and the covenant of grace, which Jesus would bring. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which was the law, or Hagar. For this, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which is where Moses got the Ten Commandments, where he spent 40 days and 40 nights with God with no water, no food. He was in the presence of God, and the man lost track of time. Okay? But we came back with the commandments of God. There was thunder and smoke and lightning and cracking and boom, boom. People looking up like, what in the world is going on up there? We are scared. And God said, will you obey my commandments? People look at the cloud like, oh, yeah, we're going to obey. How many of y'all, if y'all looked up right now, and y'all saw these thunderous black clouds and lightning striking the ground and all this booming and clattering, and God said, will y'all obey my commandments? How many of y'all going to look up and say, nah, man. No. No, no, no. No, you look up at them clouds too and say, yeah, we're going to do them. Knowing you can't do half the stuff he's about to tell you. But it came with fear. It came with fear. They responded in fear, knowing that they couldn't respond in true love and obedience. So they said they would. The second one, or Arabia, and, respond, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. So Hagar represents bondage, which is the law, or flesh pleasing to God, or sowing to your flesh to reap the harvest of God. Let's keep going. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all, which is Sarai. And look at what it says. For it is written, it's coming out of Isaiah. Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now, I used to read that all the time, and I could not understand what in the world that meant until yesterday. God, open it up. Rejoice, O barren. Now, why would Sarah want to get excited about not having children? The scripture's going to tell us. 
He says, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. So I looked up that word desolate. What does desolate mean? Desolate means deserted. Desolate means empty. Desolate means no expectation. It means no hope. Hagar was a slave. Hagar didn't have any expectation. But Hagar was having his children. So you having the children. You have no future. The future is in the promise. So the one who can't have a baby is the one that needs to be rejoicing because she's about to produce something that has expectation. So even though you may not be seeing things in the natural, there are things going on within you that the people can't see. You may be seeing people in your life that seem to be producing life. Don't look at their life and begin to question why you don't have it. Stay in the promise. Begin to thank God that your promise is coming to pass. What's in me? He that begun a good work in me shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The word is at work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. So though I don't see with my natural eyes, I know in my spirit, so I rejoice. I rejoice because my life is going to produce joy. Some of y'all may not know, but Isaac means laughter. So the barren woman trusted God and because she trusted God, she could rejoice because she would produce joy. <sighs> he turned that woman's morning into dancing. <sighs> she took off that weary clothing and put on the oil of joy. When she held her baby boy in her arms. So what am I telling you? Your life may not look the way you want it to look. But you don't base your life based on what you see. Because if you base your life based on what you see, you're going to sow back into your flesh. You're going to go try and make something happen that you think God wants for you. But that ain't what God wants for you. Because that ain't his best. That comes with a curse attached to it. Understand, again, it's reaping and sowing. So Ishmael came out of Hagar. Sarah jumps on Hagar. Hagar takes off with the baby because Sarah told Abraham, kick, kick her out. So she gets kicked out. But the angel of God comes to her and says, I'm going to bless him too. I'm going to make 12 tribes out of him too. Why? Because he came out of that same seed. You reap it, he's reaping what he sowed. But because he sowed it in the flesh, those 12 tribes ended up being a problem for the world. You catching what I'm saying? Ishmael was a wild man. So yeah, it came and it produced. But it didn't produce what God wanted it to produce. His name means God hears. God heard Hagar and said, I'll bless him, but he's going to be a problem. Some of us have made issues or errors in our life. We missed it. And we pray, God, please, please, please don't let this come to pass. And it still happened. And the grace of God is on your life to deal with it. But every day you still have to look at that problem. You still got to look at it. There's a thorn there. It's hurting you. Every day. And you can pray and pray all you want to. But he said, my grace will be sufficient. It'll be strength when you're weak. Hmm? Them bad choices we made. That God came and healed us. He delivered us from them. Yeah, we delivered. But we still got to look at it in the natural. God, I wish I'd never done that. But his grace is still there to keep you and walk with you and work with you. And strengthen you so you don't continue to make the same issue a problem. 
Am I getting to anybody? You've been redeemed from that issue, but yet you still must live through that issue. But you're not going to do it in your flesh. You're going to do it by his spirit. So how do I sow in my spirit? I sow his word in my heart. I'm not going to be anxious for nothing. But in prayer and supplication, I'm going to make my request made known unto him. And he promised me that his peace, which passes all understanding, will guard my heart and mind. I will not allow my soul to be downcast. I'm going to keep my hope in God. I may not see what I want to see, but I will see the promise of God fulfilled in my life. Am I speaking to anybody? Am I speaking to anybody? Your life is not done. It is not finished. Just because there was an issue, just because there was a blemish, just because there was a hiccup does not mean God stepped off the throne and said, I'm done with you. God is still on the throne and his word is still working for you just like it did yesterday, just like it did 10 years ago, just like it did before you were ever born, just like it did before the earth was ever spoken into existence. His word over your life will bring promise to your life no matter what your condition looks like. The question is, will you stay in the word? Will you stay? Will you hold? Will you keep your knees on the ground and pray and cry out to the Lord from your heart? Will you sing unto the Lord a new song from your heart? This comes from your heart, not your head. This is a worship. It is a spiritual expression of my heart to God. My sound ain't going to sound like yours. My prayer ain't going to sound like yours. My song ain't going to sound like yours. But you don't know where I've been. The woman who came to Jesus, who was being hosted in a house, came to him with a flask of oil. The host did not even recognize Jesus in his house as the custom should. He should have washed his feet, but he didn't. But this woman came and she broke open her flask. She poured it on his head. and She washed his feet with her hair. What was that? That was my heart. This man redeemed me. I was a wretch undone. But when I met him, he redeemed me. He's worth everything this box represents, which is all my wealth. He's worth every part of me. So I break it open on him. And I wash him with my words, my adoration, my worship, my thanksgiving. And the people around us say, what you doing? Yes, that's worth a whole lot of money. You're wasting money. But the very one that's saying it is the one that's stealing. But no, Jesus says she's doing the right thing. She's preparing me. You got to prepare a place for it. When you sow this word in your heart and you begin to prepare a place for him, he reigns on it. The only thing that will make a seed of supernatural quality grow is a supernatural rain. What's that called? Revival. That's called revival. We don't need another gimmick in the church. We just need the church to be the church. We need to respond to God so that he'll show up in our midst. We need to respond to the word of God so he'll show up in your struggle. We need to respond to the word of God so that he can teach us how to grow what he has put in us. Ishmael picked on Isaac. He picked on him because he was the little brother. 
but Isaac was the son of promise. So what does that mean? Your past is going to try to pick on your future. It's going to try to tell you that you will not become who God said you're going to be because you still got this and that. You're still dealing with this and that. You're still fighting with uncle so-and-so. You're still fighting with aunt this, that, and the other. You still got these thoughts in your head. But Sarah said something. The woman of promise said something to the man of faith and said, kick out the bond woman. Kick out the past. And Abraham was contemplating it. And the Lord said, do as the promise said. Get rid of the bond woman and her baby. Because he's not an heir of a promise. Sarah is. What am I telling you? Kick out your past. And all of the little babies that it's done had that done crept up in your life and trying to torment you. Kick it out. Because you are an heir of promise. And it's time to start taking this word seriously. It's time to start sowing it in your heart so that it will speak to you and it will begin to produce the life that God wants you to have. Your life has promise. There are miracles in your life that God wants to show you. There are miracles that are going to come at your hand. Is everybody with me? There are miracles that are going to happen on your job. There are miracles that will happen in your school because you're going to do them. I say that by faith and confidence in God's word that he that received this word, that word will produce in you the life of God. Don't let your flesh tell you you're not. Don't let naysayers tell you you're not. Trust the word of God. Kick those other options out and stick with God. If you're standing here today and you've made many errors in your life or you see that your life isn't producing the way that God has called you to produce, you don't see the things of God happening in your life, but yet you see it all around you, what am I telling you to do? I'm telling you to rejoice. Do the opposite of what you feel. Yeah, I know you want to get sad. You want to get upset. You want to check the job. You want to check the money resources. You want to check this person, check that person. No, search your heart and rejoice in the Lord. Lift your hands and just start praising him right there in the midst of your crying. Shout unto him. Open up your heart. How many of you know God is not afraid of tears? He's not afraid of tears. Some of us had not given to God a good cry in so long. There are times when you just need to weep before the Lord. That's sacrificial. That means something in me is dying. And I want it to die because I'm tired of dealing with it. I'm tired of living with it. It's a terrible roommate. But God, I'm giving this roommate up today. I will produce in my life. This church is going to produce. It is. It's going to produce. It's going to. Because there's a word on it. There's a word on it. There's a word on it. And if you're sitting in this house, it's on you. It's on you. Say, it's on me. We'll produce. Your life is going to produce some beautiful things. Did you know that? Because the hand of God is on your life. Your life is going to produce some good things. Because the hand of God is on your life. Look at somebody and tell them, your life is going to produce some good things. Because the hand of God is on your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. 